Welcome to Fantasy Cartography, the show where we see what maps can teach us about fantasy and what fantasy can teach us about maps. On today's episode, we're going to look at whether the Lonely Mountain, home of the Kingdom of Durin and lair of the great dragon Smog, could really exist. Short answer, only on Mars. Mountains are important. As a geologist, if I'm trying to break down the history of a landscape, real or fantastical, the first thing I'm going to do is figure out where the mountains are and how they got to be there. And conversely, if you want to make a geologically accurate fantasy map, I think that the first thing you should do is figure out where the mountains are and how they got to be there. To explain how mountains work, I need to explain a bit of basic geology. The surface of the earth is made out of two different kinds of crust, oceanic and continental. Oceanic crust is thin and very dense, while continental crust is much thicker and much less dense. The Earth's crust is broken into large slabs of rock called tectonic plates. All the tectonic plates move slowly around, pushed and pulled by forces inside the Earth's mantle and core. There are three types of boundaries between the tectonic plates. Divergent boundaries, where they move apart, transform boundaries, where they move sideways past each other, and convergent boundaries, where they move into each other. When you're talking about mountain building, it's mostly the convergent boundaries that you're interested in. What happens at a convergent boundary depends on what kinds of crust are being pushed together. When an oceanic plate is pushed into a continental plate, Because the oceanic plate is more dense, it gets pushed underneath into the mantle, a process called subduction. But the oceanic plate doesn't go quietly. The water and sediments attached to the subducting plate melt and rise upwards, pushing through the continental plate and forming a volcanic mountain range. When this kind of mountain range is formed, it usually follows the continental coastline. You can expect to find huge blocks of granite, cone-shaped explosive stratovolcanoes, and a fair number of earthquakes. The Andes Range on the west coast of South America is the best example of an active continental subduction range on the Earth today, and you'll find landscapes in the Andes that put fantasy writers to shame. In older, inactive continent ocean convergence zones, the runoff from the mountains as they erode creates fertile basins along the coast. You can see this with the Great Dividing Range along the east coast of Australia. Most of the cities along the east and southeast coast of Australia have been founded in these basins, so most Australians live in the runoff of ancient volcanoes. If we look at some fantasy maps, then we can see a few examples. The Stanford University Geology of Westeros posits that the Black Mountains in the northwest were formed by a subduction zone, as well as the hills of Norvos and the Mountains of the Moon. I would propose that the mountains along the east coast of Namoray, from Celia Dart Thornton's Bitterbind trilogy, are an active subduction zone, especially considering that Namoray is very volcanic. When two oceanic plates converge, it's a similar process. The denser plate will subduct under the other, and the partial melting will form a line of volcanoes. The difference is that because they're coming out of the ocean, the volcanoes will form what's called an island arc. The Japanese and Indonesian archipelagos are the two standout examples of island arcs on the Earth. Island arcs are usually very fertile, but also very prone to earthquakes and volcanoes. Good island arcs are a bit rare in fantasy novels. The best one that I could find in my library was Melsina from the Malorian. I've also found very good examples in Final Fantasy games. The islands of Wutai and Medeal in FF7 could be arc islands, and Spira in FF10 looks to be one big interconnected island arc. I suppose it does make sense that a Japanese company has such a good grasp of what an island arc is like. These arcs are kind of implausibly large by Earth standards, but the Final Fantasy series has a really weird sense of scale in general. Now, what's really interesting is what happens when two continents converge with each other. See, because continental crust isn't very dense, it can't be subducted. Instead, what happens is the two continents ram into each other and shove, pushing the land upwards into mountains. 
These kinds of mountain range will get occasional earthquakes, but you aren't very likely to find active volcanoes. There's one really good example of collision mountains on the Earth today, the Himalaya Mountains and the Tibetan Plateau, which were formed about 10 million years ago when India came crashing into Asia at very high speed for a continent. There aren't many collision mountains on the Earth today, but they're very useful as an explanation for fantasy mountains. Lots of fantasy novels have big, inexplicable mountain ranges in the middle of the world or on the border between two countries, yet another trend that probably goes back to Lord of the Rings, and most of the time we can explain them as the probable result of continental collision. We have the Far Reach Mountains in Dark Glass Mountain, the Bior Mountains in Eragon, the Barrier Mountains in Deltura Quest, pretty much all of my regular touchstones for this series. There is one geological process which can form mountains without needing a subduction zone, a phenomenon called a hotspot. A hotspot is a place where magma from the Earth's mantle decides that it wants to see the world and pushes up through the Earth's crust. That isn't me simplifying my explanation for the people in the audience without a geology degree. Geologists actually don't know what makes hotspots happen. They're more likely to happen at a place where the crust is already weak from a plate boundary, but they can also burst through the middle of a plate hundreds of kilometres away from the nearest boundary. This is where the islands of Hawaii come from, a hotspot that's pushing through the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. If you trace the peaks of Hawaii and the nearby underwater mountains, they make straight lines with a kink to the northwest. What's happening here is that the hotspot is staying in the same place, and the Pacific Plate has moved along the top of them. The kink is a point where the Pacific Plate changed direction. In fantasy mapping, hotspots are pretty much a get out of jail free card. You can justify a mountain range almost anywhere by saying a hotspot did it. In fact, in Chris Ingalls geological breakdown of Middle Earth, he came to the conclusion that every mountain range in Middle Earth was formed by hotspots because they didn't make sense any other way. But one thing to be cautious of with hotspots is that the lava from hotspot volcanoes is usually quite runny by lava standards, which means that they spread outwards in a flat shield shape. If you want a big, pointy, explosive, Mount Doom-type composite volcano for a villain to build their lair inside, you'll probably be better off using a subduction zone. Now, one running theme through this video has been that mountains form in lines and ranges. It's very rare on Earth to have a single mountain standing high above an utterly flat landscape. Mount Kilimanjaro is probably the closest thing we have to that, and even then it's just a mountain which happens to be a lot taller than the other mountains in its range. The visual image of a lonely mountain is great, but it's something that wouldn't really happen on Earth. On the other hand, you can find a lonely mountain on Mars. Olympus Mons, the highest mountain on any of the rocky planets of the solar system, is 22 kilometres tall with a base roughly the size of France. You see, billions of years ago, Mars didn't have tectonic plates, but it did have hot spots. So unlike the Hawaiian Islands, which grew for a while before the plate moved on, Olympus Mons just kept growing and growing. I'd hate to think of the dragon who lives inside that mountain. That's it for this episode of Fantasy Cartography. As always, please stay until after the credits for the unrelated, interesting fact of the day. Please subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon if you want Google to bother you when I upload. And if you learned anything from this video, please like. Uh, the full script, including references, is available at fantasycartography.tumblr.com and you can ask me questions using the Tumblr Ask box. If you think I've made any mistakes, or if there's anything you'd like me to expand on, then please email me at fantasycartography at iinet.net.au. Uh, like on Facebook, follow on Twitter, tell your friends, feel free to ask me questions, and until next time, may your fantasy be cartographic, and may your cartography be fantastical. At 8,848 metres above sea level, the peak of Mount Everest is the highest point on Earth, but that doesn't make Everest the tallest mountain. Mauna Kea, 
one of the volcanoes making up the Big Island of Hawaii is over 10,000 metres from base to peak. It's just that about 7,000 metres of that is underwater. Climbing to the peak of Mauna Kea is actually very easy, but getting to the base requires very specialised diving equipment. Bye! <laughs>